Welcome to HackBits, where we cover a variety of cybersecurity subjects. Join your host, Gaspar Martirano, as he interviews cybersecurity experts and discusses the latest cybersecurity news, trends, data breaches, and updates on state-sponsored cybercrime. All right. Welcome. Uh, hope everyone is doing well today. Uh, today we have a special guest uh, to the show, uh, Howard Williamson, correct? I just want to make sure I pronounce your name correctly. <laughs> Yeah, common spelling, Gaspar. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know, when you have a name like Gaspar, uh, Gaspare, actually, you know, people screw it up all the time. So I guess I'm uh, <laughs> always cognizant of getting everyone else's name correct. Um, so uh, this is uh, Hackbits. Uh, this is a uh, sponsored by LifeRs. Uh, LifeRs is a global leader in incident response, digital forensics, uh, penetration testing, ransomware mitigation, and uh, cyber uh, res- resiliency services. Um, and we've been working for decades on different high profile cases in coordination with for law enforcement agencies around the world. And I'm lucky to have Howard here because Howard actually works for here for, for with uh, life ours. So, um, Howard, why don't you tell me a little bit about you yourself and your position, a bit about your background, and then we can uh, take it from there. Sure. So uh, I was brought on board to be the assistant director of digital forensics and incident response. Uh, and so essentially what that means is. I coordinate uh, our responsiveness uh, to technical issues uh, being faced by our clients. So I make sure that the services are being provided accurately, uh, that the quality is at the top of the game, that all of the forensic items or forensic artifacts are being analyzed appropriately and reported appropriately. If I need to, I write reports. If I need to, I write declarations. If I need to, I can testify. So there's a, there's a wide range of items that I kind of bring to the table. Uh, I've been involved in one way or another with digital forensics since 1997. So I have, I've worked as a computer crimes investigator. I have worked as a consultant. I've worked inside of corporations. I've trained multitudes of people all over the world. Uh, I currently teach uh, part-time at the University of Southern California, uh, just a small university here in Los Angeles. And I teach undergrads uh, the introduction to digital forensics. So uh, uh, one part you left out, and I happen to know, is about your career started in uh, law enforcement, did it not? Yeah, I started as a computer crimes detective. And, and that was before you got into, um, obviously, the corporate world. So you did work in, oh, that absolutely. in California? Absolutely. Yeah, so absolutely. So I was uh, part of the Long Beach Police Department. And back in 1996, they started up a computer crimes unit and staffed it with a single sergeant. And by 97, they realized that they needed a detective in there as well. And so they put out uh, a open rec for a computer crimes detective and i applied and ended up getting the position so uh back then uh ransomware was it uh, did you ever even know did the word exist uh, in 1996 no. of ransomware <laughs> uh, you know <laughs> i started ransomware. my hacking days uh when i was young on my you know commodore 64 and my vic 20 and i would uh you know try to try to shut lights on and off in a building or something you know that was probably the extent of my hacking when i was uh, 14 years old <laughs> yeah, you know, the well, good old my, days. My my first computer was actually a TRS eighty, a Trash eighty. So that'll give you an idea of of, of where I started things. Uh, so it was uh, like a two or three inch wide printer. It had a cassette tape so for long term storage or cartridges that you could use for various applications and and things like that. So that was the the first computer I got involved with. In. I did a little bit of programming and, and whatnot in high school, and I've always had a, an interest in technology. So uh, when the spot opened up, uh, I put in for it and got selected for it, and that's kind of where I've been, you know, for the last twenty four years now. So so you know, since then, obviously. Um you know, hacking and ransomware and, you know, threat actors uh, causing havoc, uh, you know, to government and non-government agencies is just getting worse and worse as time goes on. So talk a little bit about what the, you know, what the economic impact is of of what's happening today uh, in the past year or two. Yeah, I mean, so the, the, it's important to realize that ransomware is is here and and we've got these fancy terms for it like you know, we we have with hacking or anything else but it's still extortion 
right? It's, it's still somebody holding you hostage for something to get money out of you. Just like hacking is really just simply burglary, right? It's just somebody coming into an area that they shouldn't be in, didn't have author- authorization to come in or your permission to enter and they broke in. It's not any different than breaking into your house. They just break into your computer system. So we have all these kind of fancy words for those types of activities. But the reality is uh, they're the same things that have been going on for years and years and years. From a ransomware standpoint, uh, the economic impact is is huge. It can be huge on an organization. It can be huge on you know everybody on, in the world. I mean, you're talking at you know just in 2020, you're looking at probably a third of a billion dollars, probably 350 million, 400 million dollars paid out in ransoms in 2020 alone. I mean, that's several hundred percent higher than where it was in 2019. Uh, you know, it's only getting worse. And as ransomware impacts larger and larger organizations, the payouts end up becoming bigger and bigger. I've seen payouts as low as, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars hundred thousand dollars. Uh, I've seen them as high as two million dollars uh, being requested by the threat actors to turn over the decryption keys and prevent the release of data that got exfiltrated out of these organizations. I mean you look at colonial pipeline that just happened recently. They paid for almost five million probably out to uh, the threat actors dark side. And even though they may have recovered about half of it, I think they ended up recovering 2.2 to 2.3 million dollars of that in in the Bitcoin. That's still a couple million dollars that went out the door that they don't have back. And the yeah. longer the longer that they ha- the longer between the payout and the recovery, the less chance there is of actually recovering any of that money. Yeah, and I, I think what folks uh, sometimes don't realize it's not just what the insurance company or the you know or the, or the business is paying out to these hackers, it's uh, how it affects the lives of everyone else that are involved in that hack. And I don't just mean the employees; I'm talking about customers, uh, especially if their information is you know is uh, stolen somehow. So it 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 goes a lot bigger than just that that insurance payment or that that ransom payment. It it hurts people um, not only monetarily, but but also in a psychological way, knowing that their data is out there. Like I, mine has been hacked so many times at this point, you know, from different agencies um, around <laughs> that I've been using over the years that, um, you know, I know I'm out there and there's not much I can do about it except for, um, you know, just, just stay on top of things and make sure I'm not, uh, my identity isn't stolen. Well, yeah, I mean, that's that thing. There are a number of precautions that everybody needs to be taking uh, because, you know, honestly, all of their data, all of everybody's data is at risk, right? Everything. If you put it on the computer and you put it on the internet, it's at risk in one way or another. It just is. The internet is forever. You put it out there, it's not coming back anytime soon. So people uh, need to kind of be cognizant of that. So, and take the appropriate so, precautions. Yeah. So look, um, I think one of the things that uh, businesses need to realize is that, you know, or, or you tell me like, what, to, what is the extent you can go to, to mitigate that risk? I mean, uh, you know, you, you put all these things in place, right? So you want to make sure you have uh, the right systems in place, the right people in place to, to protect yourself, uh, you know, the company from, from having an issue uh, and protect the data. But, but how far does that go? I mean, there's only so much you can do. Is that correct? Or is there anything that's 100% foolproof? No, there's nothing 100% foolproof any more than there's 100% foolproof preventing a burglar from getting into your house. Right? I mean, if it's it's about deterrence, not 100% prevention. Right. Right? I mean, even even the most fancy, most technologically advanced system has a potential for being breached. There is nothing that is 100% protect you unless you just completely disconnect. Right. Sure. Like if you don't, there you go. <laughs> it's hard to break into, a, it's, it's hard to break into a house if you don't have a house. Likewise, <laughs> if you don't use technology, you don't leverage technology, you don't have a computer system that you operate off of, 
then you're protected from being hacked because there's nothing there. Likewise, if you don't drive, you won't get into a car accident. So the Amish are pretty much protected from any cyber, uh, <laughs> some cyber incidents, uh, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's those folks that, that just are complete Luddites and don't have technology. They don't believe in it. They don't leverage it. They don't use it. They don't see a need for it. And they exist quite happily without it. So let's talk about organizations that, that obviously have the technology. So what can they do to protect their organizations? What are some of the things that they can do to, to, to really try to mitigate that risk and, and, and try to lower that percentage of, of being hacked or, or, or reacting fast enough after a breach happens? So what are some of the things that can be done to protect an organization? Yeah, I mean, I'll just kind of speak from my own professional experience here is keep things updated, <laughs> like like update your operating systems, update the software that you use, apply the security patches that get released to protect yourself, update your browsers, you know, keeping those items up to date uh, against the latest threats will go a long way to mitigating that issue right so it, it's it's huge we see a lot of instances where folks are running really old software that hasn't been patched and the attack that that cripples them isn't necessarily the newest latest you know zero day type of an attack it's an attack that's been out for months and right. months and months but because they haven't patched right. they weren't protected and as a result they got victimized as a so, result, you know, because of that. So, so what about backups? I know, look, years ago, uh, and you probably remember as well, where, you know, everything was in house and you had these, you know, the, the old tape machines and, and mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, running an IT department and just like, you know, someone saying I needed a file restored and I'm thinking to myself, well, I hope it worked last night, you know? So is there any excuse today not to have up to date you know, backups of your data that's readily available. And how important is it that you have that? It's hugely important. If that data is important to the organization, it needs to be protected. And that includes having a robust, intact backup system, right? So whether you're, you're backing it up to, to cloud areas, whether you're backing it up to tape, like just backing it up, will go a long way to protecting yourself, but that's not all. Backing it up is only a, a portion of what needs to occur because backups, if they are accessible from your network, mm -hmm. are one of the primary targets of a ransomware gang. Because right. if they, they, they know that people will use those as a recovery mechanism to get around paying. And so what they will do is encrypt those backups if they are accessible. So while they're scouting the network, while they're looking around to kind of get the lay of the land, they will put that as priority one. That right. is the, the first thing that they need to go after and encrypt is those backups. Because if the backups are intact, then there's no incentive for the victim to pay because they'll just restore the non-encrypted data and they'll move on. Right. So right. if you're going to do those backups, keep them separated from your infrastructure, disconnect them, store them offline, put them somewhere where they, they're not, you know, accessible from your network. Right. And then that will therefore, again, go a long way to mitigate the problem. I've had some customers that were small enough to back up all their critical data to external hard drives. And that's just what they did. They, right. they backed it all up to external hard drives and they put copies you know, locally. They had a copy in their you know office and then they had another copy in a fire safe offsite somewhere. So at the end of the day, that, that could make or break a business and how quickly you're going to be back up and running. Correct. So if you have that, yeah. You have that backup ready to go and say it's sitting in a safe in your office and someone, you know, you get attacked and you say, okay, well, you know, the backup might be a day behind, but I could just, you know, uh, uh, put this tape in and restore and I'm good to go. Uh, obviously, you start to patch up whatever issue uh, happened for them to get in in the first place. But at the same time, uh, they can be up and running quickly. So, so my point is, how do you, what do you do in order to um, make sure that your systems, the systems they have in place and even the staff you have in place 
are prepared for a breach, uh, you know, pre and post. Participate in tabletop exercises, contract with somebody, develop one yourself, you know, whichever, whatever works for you. Have those tabletop exercises that will simulate a real world event so you can test your procedures and make sure that they will adequately resolve the issue and get you back up and operating as quickly as possible with a minimal amount of angst and anxiety, right? So, So those kinds of things, a lot of people will create a policy, but they'll never test it. They'll never work through the the fine points about it. They'll they'll never ensure that it works. They'll make backups, but they'll never restore for the, from them and see what's involved with restoring and how fast it takes to restore a complete server or the, all of the file servers or anything along those lines. And so they don't have any idea of of what the reality is of getting back on their feet. Right. So you know, having those kinds of exercises putting yourself in those kinds of positions as uncomfortable as they are will go a long way to, to making sure that the organization is ready for this type of an event, because the reality is given what we're seeing, it's not a question of if you're going to get hit. It's more of a question of when you're going to get hit. Yeah. And it's funny, the similarities between what you described and like the, uh, you know, the physical world are so, so stark. And for example, I used to live in Florida and people would go out and buy generators, for example, Mm -hmm. uh, because of all the hurricanes and they would keep it in the box and uh, all of a sudden hurricanes coming. And now they're worried about, well, do I have gasoline for it? And I never unboxed it. Does it even work? And they Mm -hmm. find themselves, you know, testing the generator, uh, you know, moments before this, the hurricane hits. So uh, but being prepared and having those tabletops uh, seems to be an important aspect of what you need to do. Be prepared uh, for your cyber hurricane heading your way or tornado heading your way. Um, and how about penetration testing? Just, to, you know, someone from the outside testing, testing your systems. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Well, that goes along with that goes along with the tabletop exercises. Correct. So you're you're testing your systems and tabletop exercises. You're generally testing your policies and procedures. Uh, a pen test is going to test your threat landscape and test your environment, test your network, see how robust your security is and ensure that it is ready to deal with the latest threats that are out there. Most organizations do not have the personnel needed to stay up to date with that, you know, threat with the threats that are are occurring now. And so the best thing to do is find somebody that is up to date with all the latest and greatest, you know, tricks and traps that are being used and hire those folks to come in and test your security. It's much better to be done it having it done under a controlled situation than it is to have, you know, an uncontrolled situation from some sort of threat actor to come in because you know, if you've hired somebody, they're at least working on your behalf and you can interact with them. You can talk with them. You, you, there's zero danger that you're not going to get taken uh, as a victim for this kind of a thing. But, sure. but the, having the pen tests done regularly is, is an excellent way to, to make sure that your network is secure and robust and ready to go. Right. But understanding- you know changes, right? I mean, things change. So it's, I think that doing one pen test and sitting back saying, okay, we're great. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that six months from now, eight months from now, that things will be the same. So issues can still arise. So doing it on a regular intervals, I'm assuming is, is important. Correct. I mean, I've had a number of, of clients that haven't ever had a pen test done. When I ask them, and that's yeah. that's part of my scoping questions is, you know, when was the last pen test done? And almost, you know, without fail, it's, well, it hasn't been done. We, you know, we've been trying to get to it. Yeah. And, and we hear that a lot as well. Like oh, we were, we were going to implement this. We were going to be doing this. We were about to do this. This was on our roadmap. And for whatever reason, it keeps getting kicked down the road because people don't think it can happen to them. And, right. and the fact is, is it's going to happen to you eventually. It's, it's just a matter of time and you need to be prepared for it. So uh, we only have a couple of minutes left, but let's talk a, a little bit uh, before we wrap things up about uh, forensics. I think, I think 
uh, the term people always think of some crime drama, right, on TV when they think of forensics <laughs> of like chalk outline on the floor of someone. So talk a little bit about digital forensics and uh, what role it plays in, in the overall cybersecurity. Sure. So, so basically from a, a forensics perspective, our job is to figure out what happened and why. Correct. So we're there to, we're much more of a reactive type of a situation, meaning an event has occurred and we're brought in to figure out what occurred and what situation was in play that allowed that to occur. And usually it's bad things, right? Like we're never called when, when good things are happening. We are almost always called after something bad has happened. Right. Right. And so our, our job is to work with the client to understand their threat landscape and understand where the data is and try and figure out what occurred and whether that means collecting logs, um, which for whatever reason, again, like most things, people don't, you know, they don't take the time to make sure that they're, they're robust enough to actually preserve the necessary data data for us to answer the questions that they have. A lot of times we'll get in and, and the logs are set for a week, right? Or they're, they're set for some, you know, arbitrarily low amount of time, or they're not logging the correct things. And they want to know like what emails were looked at and what folders were they gone? You know, did the attacker go into? Well, based on how you guys have set up the logs, I can't answer those questions. I'd love to be able to, but the fact is, is I don't have the information in front of me and I don't have the information available to me to be able to answer those questions. And so it, it, they find it, it becomes very frustrating uh, for the client because they're in a bad way and they want these questions answered. And we'd love to answer those questions, but given the information that we have to work with, we can't. Um, so it, it becomes problematic. But like I said, it, whether we're collecting logs and looking at those, whether we're collecting email and looking at that, whether we're collecting disk images and looking at that, network traffic logs, firewall logs, EDR logs, things of those nature. And all that important, nature. right? All important for evidence that if there is going to be some, uh, you know, court case or prosecution, you're going to need all that anyway, correct? You're going to want all that for evidence. Well, the more information, the better, right? And and what's important to understand is that it's preserved in a way that allows it to be used in court, right? Like you can, you can just copy paste the logs. You can you drag and drop it with your mouse and that's all well and good. And it might suffice for some sort of an immediate need. But the reality is, is that those items are going to need to be preserved in a way that allows it to be admissible in court. And that's where we come into play, right? Like that's, that's where our background as forensic examiners, as incident response consultants really comes into play because that's what we do day in and day out every day. We help clients navigate really bad situations. Well, Howard, uh, uh, it's been great. I know I, I love chatting with you, so we could probably talk for like seven hours, but, but, but I know you have a lot of work to do. Uh, so I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me for a few minutes and kind of give a high level overview of some of the things that LifeRs does and what you do. And uh, I think a lot of the information, um, obviously most of the information applies to, to all businesses. Um, but also I think even in people's personal lives, like they really need to to watch out for what they do at home on their own machines. Cause um, you know, we've, you, the viruses seem to be the least of our problems nowadays. It's just a simple virus where you run a program and it kind of gets rid of it. I think now it's, um, you know, locking up your data uh, and, and, you know, it just, it could hurt a lot of people in many different ways. So I appreciate you taking the time to kind of chat. No, not a problem. Not a problem at all. And, and a lot of these things are, are very common sense ideas like nothing that we're talking about is particularly earth shattering or or cutting edge but the reality is is that as common sense as it is it's very rare for me to encounter a, a situation professionally where all of these items are being done right someone's dropping the ball somewhere at some point <laughs> it's it's not even so much a dropping the ball thing is people get busy they get they right. they okay. have other other things that are more pressing to be that need to be done in order to keep the business continuity in play. And so these are things that, that kind of fall by the wayside because 
they're not as a high a priority as some of these other things that are going on. And so they just don't get done. Well, the, the problem is with them not getting done is it really does open the door for people with malicious intent to come in and do what they want to do. Perfect. All right, Howard, thanks so much. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time. And uh, if anyone wants more information, they can visit our website, lifers.com. That's L-I-F-A-R-S.com. And I appreciate you taking the time and we'll chat again soon. My pleasure.